the final canti of Paradiso, 30 to 33, Dante enters, to, enters into the final stage of his journey. He moves into the final place of his rest, within the Empyrean heaven. This, the tenth heaven, for the medieval scholar, was a realm which is really no place at all. It's a place of paradox and mystery, which is both at the outermost recesses of the universe, but also most interior to the cosmos. It's as if Dante, in traveling to the edge of the heaven in the Primo Mobile, went through a magical door and then found that he had entered back into the center of the universe, inside it, as it were. It's a space where the bodies of Christ and Mary dwell, and one day where all the bodies of the saints will be. But it's not a place in time, and it's not a place of extension. The best the medieval scholar could do to describe what it was is to call it a place where the bodies are formed of pure intellectual light. Is this paradoxical place then where God retains his human body and where human beings are given the powers of God? That last sentence rings out so bold that it almost sounds like heresy, but it's true. It's just Christian orthodoxy. It's worth quoting again my old teacher Christian Maves on this point. When we encounter medieval thought in a form more accurate, he says, we often do not recognize it as medieval. It seems too daring, too sophisticated, too ideologically unfettered, too non-medieval. It can even, to those who understand it, come to see at least as compelling as our own examined or unexamined assumptions about the world." End quote. For instance, note that St. Athanasius, one of the Church Fathers, famously, described, famously declared, God became man, so that man might become God. And this is exactly what we find in the last canto of the Paradiso. A human being brought so far beyond his natural capacity that he's afraid of being destroyed. As Dante looks at God, he finds that his mind is rocked by the oceanic and tempestuous power of God. So that, paradoxically, if he turned away from that vision, he would have died. Or in his own words, I believe from the keenness of that living ray that I endured, I would have been undone had I withdrawn my eyes from it. And I remember that on this account I grew more bold and thus sustained my gaze until I reached the goodness that is infinite. And then later, he adds that it was only because a lightning bolt erupted, as it were, in his mind that he was able to see it all. But my wings had not yet sufficed for that, had not my mind been struck by a bolt of lightning that granted what I asked. In other words, this is the Lumen Gloriae, that gift of light in which we can see God's light. But it's so powerful as to be frightening. Another one of my perceptive students in a class I taught just this week asked, but how can mere human beings enjoy this kind of vision? And Dante's answer is this, they can't. It's too great, too far beyond us, too big, too real, too terrifying. It can only come as a gift, but a gift for which you constantly feel yourself unworthy. You might remember that Rudolf Otto in the idea of the holy said that a true vision of God is exactly like this, one in which the creature feels that it could at any moment be undone, but at the same time the vision is too afashinans too beautiful, too fixating to turn away from. And thus here Dante, as he looks, both feels the perilous state of his mortal humanity, as if he's about to come unglued. And yet at each instant, God provides him with a gift of sustaining power so that he is not dissolved, but rather given the light in which he can continue to look. And thus while Dante sees God, he is as grateful as he is overawed. He feels in his heart that this vision is a gift beyond his power. These last Kanti, then, as my title suggests, are not only Kanti of paradox, but Kanti of surprise. And the greatest surprise is that the pilgrim can enjoy this vision without falling to pieces. But there are three more surprises I want to talk about. One, how Dante is surprised by humans in the heavenly rows. Two, how Dante is surprised by the old man Bernard of Clairvaux. And three, how Dante is surprised by the face of God. Let's proceed to the first, how Dante is surprised by humans. As Dante has ascended from sphere to sphere, he's been introduced to representative souls in each one of those heavens. 
As Beatrice explained back in Paradiso 4, the souls don't actually occupy these posts, but are rather simply showing themselves to Dante to help him understand their differing powers for receiving God, as well as the various and complementary ways in which they do so. But in the Empyrean heaven, Dante finally gets to see them all together, assembled into one great band. And the way Dante describes them is scintillating. He describes them now as the members of a vast, ordered, and cosmopolitan city. Now as marching rank in file, like soldiers in an army. Now as if they were plants in a garden. Now as if they were sparks in a river of fire. And finally, as if they were the petals of a flower. And it's this shifting use of imagery, as if the poet were looking through a kaleidoscope, that gives these final kanji such power and intensity. Because as Dante looks, the image through which he sees the saints keeps changing from one form to another. It's as if, once again, Dante is keen to show the convergence of unity and plurality. At times, the saints make up one body, like that of a flowing river or a single flower. And at times, they look like unique plants in various nooks and crannies of a formal garden. And this, as we shall see, this role that humans play in the final stage of his preparation for the vision of God is what sets Dante's poem apart from other medieval writers of the era. Dante wasn't the first medieval writer to imagine a journey which went all the way up to the Imperium. For instance, one author by the name of Bernard Silvestris, upon whose work Lewis based his own Out of the Silent Planet, wrote a really bizarre story in which an allegorical figure, nature, travels up into space to find Urania, a personification of heavenly wisdom. And together these two go into what Bernard describes as, quote, the highest terminal boundary of the outermost firmament, end quote. This is, of course, similar to how Beatrice leads Dante into the Empyrean heaven, or as she describes in Paradiso 30, we have issued from the largest body to the heaven of pure light, light intellectual, full of love, love of true good, full of joy, joy that surpasses every sweetness. A few decades after Bernard, another poet and theologian, Alan of Lille, reworked some of the major themes of his predecessor in a new allegorical story of space travel. And this one, called the Anticladianos, the star of the show is prudence. It's human wisdom who ascends through the heavens. Prudence, too, has conversations with powerful cosmic forces. At one point, she meets theology, who warns Prudence that she'll have to abandon the chariot of reason. Theology then leads Prudence beyond the starry realm, where she comes into the Empyrean, which Alan says has the form of waters of fire. Over the next 100 lines, Alan luxuriously describes the fire as crystal, or ice, which is not cold and has no frost, and does not melt when warmed. It is, quote, purer than purity, clearer than clarity, brighter than gold, a harmless fire, lacking in heat, but abounding in radiance. It's here that the whole hierarchy of angels is named, as are the saints and the virgin. Finally, Prudence sees an astonishing sight. She, quote, sees the gleam of a brimming fountain spreading forth an abundant flow of water, more beautiful than any stream. Flowing forth from the fountain is a stream which then flows back into the fountain. This is clearly a tour de force poetic moment for Alan, in which he harnesses all of his viscously paradoxical language to develop an image for the Trinity. It's a fountain of light which flows out and back into itself. The Trinity is the source of light which pulls up in this realm and forms the brilliant glory in which the angels and saints dwell. In Dante, though, the pilgrim doesn't encounter cosmic forces or allegorical personifications, but rather he's continuously surprised by human beings. He's surrounded and enveloped by historical human beings who are eager to share their stories. People who rush down to meet him, surround him and draw him up. People who condescend like Katja Guida to speak to him in a baby talk he can understand. And this is what creates the surprise that as Dante nears the end of his book, heaven gets more and more social. Human beings become more and more important for realizing a vision of God. Why? Well, as my own intellectual father, Vittorio Montemaggi says, because God is love, 
he is made visible through the loving of the human community. Let's look at, at a comparison. Just as in Bernard Silvestri's, Natura is led by Urania into the heaven of pure light, and as Prudencia is led by theology into Alan's river of fire, so is Dante conducted by Beatrice beyond the stars. This would have been a surprise for Dante's readers. How could he cast a simple Florentine girl as the lead actress in this great poem of learning? But even as Dante moves into the highest heaven, he is, as you would expect, surprised again. But first, he's shocked by the Empyrean heaven's brilliance, as if as soon as he begins entering into it, he drowns in an ocean of light. Like sudden lightning that confounds the faculty of sight, depriving eyes of taking in the clearest objects, thus did a living light shine all around me, leaving me so swathed in the veil of its effulgence that I saw nothing else. The love that calms this heaven always offers welcome with such greetings to make the candle ready for its flame. No sooner had these words reached my mind than I became aware of having risen above and well beyond my powers. And such was the new vision kindled within me that there exists no light so vivid that my eyes could not have borne its brightness. It is then, of course, that Dante is directed to look at that, quote, light that flowed as flows a river pouring its golden splendors between two banks, painted with the wondrous colors of spring. From the torrent issued living sparks, and on either bank they settled on the flowers like rubies ringed in gold. Then, as though intoxicated by the odors, they plunged once more into the marvelous flood, and as one submerged, another would come forth. Beatrice bids Dante to drink in this sight, and says that he must do so before his greater thirst can be satisfied. She also tells him that the more his alto desio, his deep desire, inflames him, the more happier she becomes. At this point, Dante's readers would have recognized that he's rewriting Bernard or Alan, faithfully following them as his guides and predecessors in constructing his own literary scene. They would have also recognized that this intense light is the Lumen Gloriae, described in Aquinas, or as Dante says, there is a light above that makes the Creator visible to every creature. But then comes Dante's surprise. The sparks which leap from the river and become the flowers on the banks turn out to be the souls of people. Quote, then like people wearing masks, once they put off the likeness not their own, in which they hid, seem other than before, the flowers and the sparks were changed before my eyes into a greater celebration, so that I saw before my very eyes both courts of heaven. Alan's river of fire then has become Dante's river of flowers and sparks. They are, of course, individual saints. Alan's river is a geographical location, but Dante's river is made up of human eyes and faces. But as we have said, in the shifting imagery of these final conti, this river of flowers transmutes itself into a thousand, thousands of petals, which all make up one single great white rose. Dante sees the whole heavenly community through all of these images, which are simultaneously mapped onto one another, like a photograph which has been double exposed, but lost none of the clarity of the original shots. He looks then at the saints as blazing individual flowers, and as forming one whole community. In form, then, of a luminous white rose, I saw the saintly soldiery that Christ with his own blood took as bride. Throughout Canto 31, it will be Dante's assigned task to survey all the ranks of this flower. For as Bernard says, let your sight fly through this garden, for seeing it will help prepare your eyes. Dante has to make a study of these ranks before the final moment of his journey, in which he looks at the center point of the heavenly community, which is yet invisible to him. But note that Bernard's allusion to the garden is reminiscent of Dante's confession of his love, five conti before, in Paradiso 26. In response to John's question, how did you come to know love? Or to use John's metaphor, by how many teeth does love bite? Dante answers, 
all those things, the bite of which can make hearts turn to God, converge with one another in my love, the world's existence and my own, the death he bore that I might live, and that which all believers hope for as I do. All these have drawn me from the sea of twisted love and brought me to the shore where love is just. I love the leaves with which the garden of the eternal gardener is in life. This then is the pilgrim's rather breathless litany of the loves which are scattered throughout the universe. He looks at the world and sees his existence, the world's being, Christ's death, and eternal life. But in light of the vision of the river and the rose to follow, then we can also see that these leaves, in which and through which the eternal gardener reveals himself, are also the souls of the community of heaven. Dante is, again, surprised by humans. This humanization of the celestial region has extraordinary theological implications. As we have seen, Dante says that looking at the rose is necessary for developing the power to see God. In other words, the lumen gloriae of Aquinas has become the spiritual radioactivity of the love and communion of saints. All of that warmth and radiant radiance they release is the light in which they see love. But then when we also remember that Dante borrowed from the vernacular lyric tradition to construct a particularly dynamic vision of lovers trying to enkindle the flames of love in one another, then we also realize that this rose is dynamic. That is, it's eternally growing in luminescence. As the community increasingly falls in love with one another, the lumen gloriae in which God is seen also grows. The lumen gloriae of heaven increases on account of the ever abounding love of the saints. And in this life, they're able to see more of, in this light, they're able to see more of God's essence. But knowing more of God's beauty fills them with the hopeful expectation of what is in store for their neighbor. And that ardent desire in turn makes them better lovers. And so in this dynamic circle, the light of heaven grows, to borrow an image from Dante, like a lightning bolt which flashes but doesn't go out. It just keeps adding to its brightness. Thus for Dante, human beings are not superfluous additions to your private enjoyment of God, but their love is the light in which you see love. And so Dante makes one final tour of the heavenly ranks. He sees Mary, the empress of heaven, most like God because she least resists his will. She's the diamond without spot through whom light flows without becoming colored or obscured. He sees next to her Peter and Adam, Moses and John, pairs of Old Testament and New Testament figures, great fathers of those people under the old and new covenant. He sees Rachel and Lucy, and finally he turns at Bernard's request to ask Mary for help. She who, because of her purity, knows how to make your soul full of God's light. But we're getting ahead of ourselves just a bit. Because with the introduction of Bernard, we come to our second surprise in these Conti. You'll remember that in Purgatorio, Dante turned around at a certain point to ask Virgil for an explanation, only to find that his guide had vanished. Similarly, here in Paradiso, Dante turns around to share his joy with Beatrice, only to find that she had disappeared, and standing in her place is an old man with a beard. Needless to say, Dante intends, this, the, intends the reader to experience a great shock when his pilgrim turns back to converse with Beatrice and finds not a young beauty, but the ancient instead. I turned with newly kindled eagerness to ask my lady many things, that kept my mind yet in suspense. I expected one thing, but found another. Instead of Beatrice, an old man, adorned as were the rest of those in glory, met my eyes. His cheeks were quite suffused with kindly joy, and from his whole appearance shone a loving father's tenderness. Then, where is she? I asked at once, and he replied, To lead your longing to its goal, Beatrice called me from my place. If you raise your eyes to the third circle, below the highest tier, you shall see her again. Now on the throne her merits have assigned. How surprising for the love poet. He turns around to share a happy smile with the girl he had always loved and finds an old man with glowing cheeks looking back at him. 
It's rather like the quirky, megalomaniac Italian director removed the lead character in the season finale of his blockbuster show. And this surprising removal of Beatrice and substitution of Bernard raises all kinds of interesting questions. Why couldn't Beatrice take Dante all the way home? Why is the old guy needed? Whatever happened to the love poet? Is beauty insufficient for, this, for completing this journey? Well, Dante gives us hints to those questions in his description of Bernard, to which I wish to turn now. At the very end of Canto 32, Bernard, noting that Dante's a lot of time is running short, asks him to do one last thing to prepare himself for his ultimate vision. Bernard says, But since the time runs short that readies for your sleep, let us fix our eyes on primal love, so that looking up toward him, you penetrate as far as may be done his brilliance. But lest by any chance beating your wings and thinking to advance you should fall back, you must gain your grace through prayer, grace from her who has the power to help you. You shall follow me with your devotion so your heart does not stray from my words. He then began this holy supplication. That's how the penultimate canto ends, pointing forward to the final end and ultimate moment, and thus it creates a tension caused by the suspension of what is just about to come. Bernard says that Dante can't fly his way home on this one. He can't even make himself use his eye or mind or intellect in the right way to get what he wants. All he can do is turn toward the center of the universe, which is yet invisible to him, long, wait, look back, look down into that black hole and ask Mary for help. And then as a gift, whatever is there, if it wishes, will come forth from his invisibility, surround Dante, seize him, embrace him, and make him its own. But for this to happen, Bernard says Dante will need the assistance of her who sees more deeply into this black hole than any other. Because given her complete and absolute humility, she doesn't obstruct at all the light of God which flows through her. And so Dante and Bernard turn to Mary and utter this prayer. Vergine Madre, figlia del tuo figlio, umile e alto più che creatura, termine fisso d'eterno consiglio. Virgin Mother, daughter of your Son, more humble and exalted than any other creature, fixed goal of the eternal plan. You are the one who so ennobled human nature that he who made it first did not disdain to make himself of its own making. Your womb relit the flame of love. Its heat has made this blossom seed and flower in eternal peace. To us, you are a noonday torch of charity, while down below, among those still in flesh, you are the living fountainhead of hope. Lady, you are so great and so prevail above. Should he who longs for grace not turn to you, his longing would be doomed to wingless flight. Bernard's prayer is full of paradoxes and extraordinary praise. The mother is the daughter of her son, humble but exalted, a torch which burns at noon, the fulcrum of the whole universal plan of history. At the same time, Bernard calls her merciful, clement, compassionate, generous, the one in whom all human virtues are found. At the same time, the whole prayer here uttered by Bernard is intentionally written in a way in which the knightly and courtly overtones are evident. For instance, in verse 3, Bernard calls Mary, Donna, my lady, in a way a troubadour poet would have addressed his beloved. When Bernard introduces himself a few conti earlier, he had said, And heaven's queen for whom I burn with love will grant us every grace, since I am her own, her faithful Bernard. That's what we have in Bernard comes as a surprise. The old Cistercian mystic turns out to be an even better lover than the hot young lover Dante. Bernard of Clairvaux in life spent years preaching through the Song of Songs and only got through the first three chapters because he kept digressing so much, trying to explain the spiritual value of the language of embrace and kiss and courtship to understand the soul's relationship to God. Bernard then was the theologian of love par excellence. At the same time, Bernard's courtly and knightly devotion to Mary parallels Dante's devotion to Beatrice. And he utters praise about Mary, just as Dante wrote about his beloved. In this way, Dante seemingly has to be taught to write a higher poetry. 
This is the crucial moment then in which Dante's poetry takes a turn. He'd spent his whole life loving, but now he must begin to see love. In the last stage of Dante's journey, the lover, having praised the beloved, now finally turns to love itself. It's soon after praying to Mary and looking upon her brightness, which is greater than that of any other creature, that Dante finds himself effortlessly and naturally lifting his gaze to look at the center of the point of the universe. He's been purified to the point that he moves with the same effortlessness, effortless naturalness that a rock falls to the ground. And this leads us to our third surprise. When Dante finally does turn to look down deep into the black hole at the center of the universe, the vision of God presented to him emerges in stages out of the depths in which it lies hidden. At first, Dante sees just the universal form, that is, a book in which all things are contained, or in Dante's words, I saw contained by, lo by love into a single volume bound, the pages scattered throughout the universe. Imagine that all the moments of time and all the different creatures in the universe are like pages pulled out from a notebook and then thrown up into the wind, scattered all over the world. In each one of those pages, the handwriting of God is discernible. That is, each historical fragment and each historical creature ha in some ways has an aspect of God revealed. But here Dante, in looking at the source, sees the universal form, that is, that sap which ran through the veins of the whole world of creatures. Dante sees the deep unity in life which lived in each of them, as if every creature is seen now reflected in that which gave it birth. Dante sees the love which is the secret source of desire and movement in the world. But for Dante, God is not just a cosmic force. He's not just the ultimate law of physics or the logos of the Stoics. No, Dante's vision deepens as more of the vision of God emerges and so from the midst of this deep unity, the secret source of vitality of the universe, Dante then sees three circles of different colors come forth. They all stand exactly on top of one another, and yet they can be seen as perfectly distinct. Obviously, this is a dynamic image for the unity and diversity of the Trinity. It's an image you can think, but couldn't actually see. But then, what is an even greater surprise? is that as Dante is looking at these overlapping rings, something else comes forth, an image, quote, painted with our likeness, looking out from within. I tried, he tells us, to see how the image fit the circle and found its where in it. In other words, Dante sees a human face. His vision of the Trinity has turned into a revelation of the Incarnation. These stages of revelation come to Dante, a little like how we keep taking off the outer shell of a Russian doll. The pilgrim first sees the secret source of life for the universe. He then sees the rings and discovers the magical unity preserved by the three persons. But then he sees God's human face, whose eyes look deeply into his. He draws near to mystery, expecting to look down into an abyss or chasm but then sees that it's actually a person who's been waiting for him. Dante is again surprised by a human, surprised by, that, by the fact that the cosmic force which turns the universe looks at him and through him and into him as if it only existed for him. And so Dante has a devastatingly personal revelation in which he is seen through and known so perfectly that nothing is left out or behind. Now we can understand the role of Bernard the old Cistercian mystic who wrote love poetry to Mary, he teaches Dante about the ultimate beloved, the Virgin. Thus, at the apex of heaven, Dante, the love poet, has to stop writing about and for Beatrice, stop being the lover, and now become the beloved himself. It's a gigantic role reversal, and it happens all at once. Dante spent his whole life seeking, striving, working, laboring, pursuing, and what he discovers in the end is that he is the beloved who has been wooed by the divine lover who now emerges out of his darkness to seek him in embrace. This is the last surprise of the comedy. 
And the final beautiful verses convey that rapture, that yielding, and that rest. For a brief moment, Dante has the energy of a lightning bolt poured into his mind to sustain his vision of gratitude, his vision of being loved. And for a brief moment, he turns in peaceful motion with that source of everything that is, or as he puts it, my wings had not sufficed for that, had not my mind been struck by a bolt of lightning that granted what I asked. Here my exalted vision lost its power, but now my will and my desire, like wheels revolving in an even motion, were turning with the love that moves the sun and all the other stars. L'amor che muove il sole e l'altre stelle.